everybody and welcome. I'm Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean here at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and I'm delighted that you could join us for what I, I'm sure you agree is a very important conversation about the Healthy Michigan Plan that is now one year old. Um, today's program would not have been possible without generous support from the Gilbert S. Ullman and Martha A. Darling Health Policy Fund, and so we very much appreciate that support. In a moment, Dr. Matt Davis will introduce today's panel more formally, but before we begin, I wanted to say just a few words about Matt. Um, well, in addition to teaching appointments at the University of Michigan's health system and also here at the Ford School, and in fact, he just came straight from teaching a class here at the Ford School, Matt serves as the chief medical executive for the state of Michigan. In this role, Matt provides the Michigan Department of Community Health with professional medical expertise on public health issues and development for related policy. Um, that really is a critical public service role, and that perspective is particularly valuable for um, the citizens of Michigan and also for the conversation that we will have here this afternoon. And today's event really is his brainchild, and so I just wanted to really express my gratitude and appreciation for putting together a phenomenal group to talk about this important set of issues. So, thank you. Um, but I have a couple of other things I want, wanted to say. Um, today's, <laughs> panel, <laughs> um, today's panel includes representatives from multiple perspectives, and I will just list them. They will be introduced in uh, just a few moments, and so um, please don't applaud right now, although of course they're all well, very worthy of applause. So first we have Ken Sikama, who is a Michigan alum and senior policy fellow at the Public Center Sector Consultants. He is a former long-term member of the Michigan Congress. Next to him, we have Rob Fowler, who is president and CEO of the Small Business Association of Michigan. Then we have Aaron Knott, who is Michigan State Director for Enroll America. Next to her, we have Laura Aka, another Michigan alumna, who is Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives at the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. And um, then we have Kim Sibilski, uh, who also studied at the University of Michigan and is the CEO of the Michigan Primary Care Association. Last but not least, here, uh, who will be joining us shortly, we have Dr. John Ayanian, who will moderate this very impressive panel. John is director of the University's Institute for Health Policy and Innovation, as well as a faculty member both in the medical school and here at the Ford School. So please join me first in a warm welcome to all of our discussants. Just a very brief word about today's format before we begin. Um, first, Matt Davis will provide us with an update about the one-year Healthy Michigan Plan. And then next, Dr. John Ayanian will introduce our panelists and um, have some individual opening remarks and then moderate a discussion. We'll save about half an hour for questions from the audience and um, I do encourage you to, um, to share your questions with us. If you have a question, please write it on a card. You should have received cards when you entered the room. Um, and Ford School volunteers will be circulating around 440 and they will continue to do so to gather the cards. If you are watching um, online, please tweet your questions to us using the hashtag policy talks. Um, our Masters of Public Policy students, Megan uh, Foster Friedman and Ruth McDonald, will read the questions later. And so I welcome them here as well. With no further ado, Matt, the floor is yours. Again, welcome. Thank you, Susan, and good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to those of you here in the room and to those of you watching on the web. I'm particularly grateful to all of you who have dedicated the time this afternoon and to members of our panel to talk about a very celebrated birthday. I won't have us all sing happy birthday, but reaching one year of age in many cultures around the world is a, uh, a reason for a lot of celebration. We're here to ask today about the Healthy Michigan Plan as it reaches its first birthday and what that means for the health, health care and health policy in our state. I have the privilege of providing some background remarks today so that we're all on the same page with regard to what the Healthy Michigan Plan means and where it currently stands. Before I go any farther, I want to acknowledge something that, that Dean Collins just mentioned, which is that I have a couple different roles. 
I'm a faculty member here at the university, which is the primary role I have today behind the microphone. I also serve as the chief medical executive for the state of Michigan, and any remarks that I make today should not be interpreted as the official stance of the Department of Community Health or of Governor Snyder. If I am asked to respond to a question as a member of the Department of Community Health, I will officially make a gesture like this, putting on a hat of that role. But otherwise, I am speaking as a faculty member here today. To understand where we are, we need to understand a bit where we've been. So let me take us back 50 years to when Medicaid was born. And we have here President Johnson signing Title 19 of the Social Security Act with Lady Bird Johnson to his right and to his left, former President Harry Truman and Bess Truman. That was a milestone that today we almost take for granted in our system, that Medicaid is a foundational bedrock of the government role in our healthcare system. But as a foundational bedrock, we have continued to have subsequent policies that have tried to do different things with Medicaid. And so five years ago, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act was born, and when President Obama signed the ACA, there was perhaps first and foremost, but certainly among the major goals, expansion of Medicaid. You see him surrounded in a very different signing ceremony, not by previous presidents and spouses, but by the Democratic leadership, which indicated the polemic nature of political support at the time this act was signed. Three years ago, so we've gone from 50 years ago to five years ago, now three years ago, the Supreme Court upheld the ACA in one decision, but in a partner decision just a few minutes later, permitted states to choose whether to expand Medicaid, and there began a cleaving of the support for Medicaid across different states. And by state boundaries. And so states, when given the permission to differ as they tend to, did differ. And we have here on the left the 2012 presidential election map separated out in the usual blue and red distribution. And then on the right, the current status of state Medicaid expansion decisions. You don't have to be an artist to recognize the similarities here. And that is a common story we have about Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act that it has strongly followed political lines in terms of the leadership at the state level in the governor's mansion and the state legislatures. In February 2013, so less than two years, or about two years ago, Governor Snyder announced his support for Medicaid expansion in Michigan, at the time saying that Medicaid expansion was a way to improve health and save money in our state, to provide greater access to care and lower business costs among beneficiaries. These will be themes that you'll hear from our panelists today. Has the Health of Michigan plan to deliver it on those promises? And what have we seen as expansion of Medicaid has occurred in our state? You'll notice I circled here in the first paragraph that the estimate of benefit was to about 320,000 residents in the first year. Keep that number in mind. Just a few months later, May 2013, Representatives Lori and Pacholka were the first to sponsor House Bill 4714, which later became the Healthy Michigan Act. This was clearly a connection to Title 19, which I've circled here on your slide, Title 19 of the Social Security Act, which had been the original Medicaid program. But there was a definite effort to not talk so much about Medicaid expansion, but rather fashion a different approach to expansion in Michigan, something that was going to lead to a healthier population. Let's talk a bit now about the navigation and negotiations that occurred during the summer of 2013 to take the bill 4714 and help it become a public act a few months later. The advantages that were put forth were to cover uninsured Michiganders, to reduce uncompensated care, meaning the care that providers would provide and would not have been paid for by uninsured individuals, to control health care costs, which Michigan is no different, have been rising in the private markets and the public markets, and to have our managed care plans, which have been a big part of the Medicare story in our state, a big positive part, help be part of the Health of Michigan plan by having all enrollees in the Health of Michigan plan be enrolled in managed care plans. The perceived disadvantages by opponents of the Health of Michigan Act were that this was really unnecessary government spending. It wasn't a wise way to spend otherwise scarce dollars. And the worries were expressed that the federal government, through the Affordable Care Act, might not sustain this enhanced match, meaning the federal government was going to cover the full cost of the program for the first three years and a slightly decreased amount the latter two, but that may not actually be how it plays out. 
that will leave Michigan vulnerable in terms of its overall budget and a plan that perhaps it wasn't prepared to pay for. This combination of advantages and disadvantages led to some focused compromises. The first was cost sharing by beneficiaries. Because if you're trying to create a less vulnerable <coughs> program, you need to have the beneficiaries with more role in that program to pay for its costs. This cost sharing, however, is unusual for Medicaid and therefore required two different waivers. Waiver one was for people over 100% of the federal poverty level up to the limit of 133% to share up to 5% of their income on the order of a few hundred dollars per year. And then waiver two, which is currently in preparation, is for individuals with over 100% of the federal poverty level income to share up to 7% of their income after being in the program for 48 months. There was also emphasis on healthy behaviors, trying to focus on the fact that individuals in Michigan, and we know this from population health measures, tend to be less healthy than in some other states. We need to try to reduce our levels of obesity, reduce our levels of tobacco use, et cetera. There was an idea to implement health risk appraisals to encourage a conversation between patients and their physicians about how to try to improve their behaviors overall. The legislature asked the Department of Community Health to set up something new called a My Health Account for individuals in the Healthy Michigan Plan to help them understand how dollars from the state government and federal government were being spent on their behalf in the healthcare system. And finally, there were specific triggers for program termination written into the act that said, if this happens or if this does not happen, then that will be the end of the Healthy Michigan Plan. With those compromises, on September 16, 2013, Governor Snyder signed the Healthy Michigan Act here in yet another signing ceremony. And with only one person in common between the signing ceremony of the ACA and the signing ceremony of the Healthy Michigan Plan, that being Representative Dingle, Chairman Dingle, mm -hmm. who, although last time I checked, wasn't directly responsible for state policy, we all know <laughs> he is out there. <laughs> <laughs> that leaves us then on April 21st, uh, April 1st, 2014, to the Healthy Michigan grant program launching, and on April 1st, 2015 a healthy Michigan program that is providing coverage not to 320,000 individuals, not to 400,000 individuals, or even 500,000 individuals, but more than 570,000 Michiganders ages 19 to 64. Far more enrollees than were anticipated even over a five-year rollout of the program. You can see here the different age groups that are involved and their different composition of the overall healthy Michigan beneficiary group. So when you have a program that was passed through a contentious debate leading to some focus compromises, and then it's subscribed to by over 50% more individuals than were expected, what do we have then in terms of questions going forward? That's what we have the pleasure of hearing about from our panelists today, our distinguished panelists. And for that discussion, which I'm looking forward to, I hope as much as you are, I turn to John, John Ianian to give us some more formal introductions. Thank you. So I'd like to join Dean Collins and Dr. Davis in welcome you, welcoming our panel and all of you to our session today and look forward to a lively discussion. Uh, as Dean Collins mentioned, uh, each of our panelists moving from your left to right will have an opportunity to speak for about five minutes sharing their opening perspective on where we stand at the one year anniversary of the Healthy Michigan Plan. And then we will open it up for questions from you from the audience for about 40 minutes. And uh, as mentioned, those questions can be passed down to our students here in the front and, and then uh, presented to the panel for their input. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, which is Mr. Ken Sikama, a senior policy fellow at Public Sector Consultants, where he focuses on public finance, environment, and energy policy. And prior to joining the firm, he served in the Michigan House of Representatives for six terms and in the Michigan Senate for two terms. And in the House, he served as the Republican leader from 1997 to 98. And in the Senate, he served as the majority leader from 2002 through 2006. Mr. Sikama. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and thanks uh, for the Ford School for hosting this. Thanks for the invitation. I'm going to make uh, three just very quick observations. First, about uh, what I think this achievement is fairly re a very remarkable achievement in terms of the politics, why it happened from my point of view, and then a, a note about the future. But I think uh, I want to 
start with a caveat. Unlike a lot of people that are actually on this panel, I wasn't involved in the day-to-day -day, you know, trench warfare of getting this passed. I watched it and observed it um, uh, close up at, at times. Uh, but because of that, uh, you know, there's a plus and a minus to that. I might actually get something wrong about what actually happened, and I would urge my fellow panelists to correct me if I do now. It'll be our pleasure. Yeah. Well, and I was, I was just going to say that I, I've worked with a couple of these, in the, these people in the past, and they've never needed encouragement from me to correct me. So, um, but with that disclaimer, let me just make three observations. From a political perspective, this should not have happened. I don't mean it's a bad idea. I'm just saying, given the very bitter and really visceral politics of the Affordable Care Act, from the beginning, um, I'm glad that Matt had these slides about President Johnson signing Medicaid in 1965 and President Obama signing the Affordable Care Act in 2010. The Affordable Care Act passed with no single Republican vote. None. Zero. Medicaid in 1965 Almost half of the Republicans serving in the U.S. Senate and the Congress voted for both Medicaid and Medicare. So from the beginning, uh, the politics of the Affordable Care Act uh, have been very bitter, and they've just gotten worse since. Um, really, if, if there's any kind of hint of association with the Affordable Care Act on a Republican side, it's almost like your Republican and your conservative credentials are being questioned. So from that point of view, the fact that any red state, and I think there's 10, maybe 10 of them, that have, had Republic, that have Republican governors have expanded Medicaid. But from, from that standpoint, the fact that any red state expanded Medicaid because it's connected to the Affordable Care Act, that's a remarkable political achievement. So that's my first comment. My second comment is, sort of, well, okay, why, why did this happen? And, um, you know, first of all, I think some people that are on this panel and others have to take credit for the work they did in, in getting it passed. But I really don't think that's kind of um, what uh, got uh, Medicaid expansion over the top here in Michigan. Uh, I, I would think, I, I would say and suggest that it goes back to a very specific event where the Speaker of the House, Jace Bolger, asked then Representative Mike Shirky, a very ideologically conservative, almost Tea Party um, legislator in the House, to take a look at this issue and, and render his opinion as to whether it ought to pass or not. And um, it, was, it was Mike Shirky and sort of what I would call uh, some like-minded, very conservative legislators that said, you know, this really does make sense for Michigan, and we ought to pass this. Um, and I think if it weren't for that, um, the embracement of this uh, expansion by, by Mike Shirky, who's now in the state senate and chairs of the health committee in the state senate, I don't think it would have passed. Um, now, you know, can't prove a negative, but um, maybe it would have, maybe it wouldn't. But he gave it the conservative credential it needed here in Michigan. Now, if, you, if he were sitting here, as opposed to me, and you asked him, why'd you do it? You know, why did you come to this conclusion? Uh, I, I think he would say the following. Uh, first of all, he would probably start by saying, from his standpoint, it was a lesser of two evils. Uh, not wild about the Affordable Care Act, but from his standpoint, uh, kind of three things stood out. One is um, sort of it's like the stages of grief. He, he accepted the fact that the Affordable Care Act wasn't going to mysteriously and magically disappear. Uh, and I think that's, uh, he made a departure from his conservative colleagues in that sense. Um, he sort of accepted the fact it was here to stay, at least in the near term. Secondly, uh, from a conservative fiscal standpoint, it, it just kind of made sense. I mean, the federal government's going to pick up um, 
100% of the cost for the first few years, and then uh, promises to pick up 90% uh, after that. And so from, from his standpoint, and sort of a conservative political standpoint, fiscal standpoint, it doesn't make sense for Michigan to forego those dollars. I mean, we're sending our tax dollars to Washington. There's probably taxes associated with the Affordable Care Act. Some people claim it's $2 billion coming out of Michigan. I don't know if that's right or not. But, you know, from his standpoint is, you know, if we're sending that money to Washington, why should it just go to other states? You know, why not recoup some of that? So the stages of grief, acceptance, fiscal argument, it made sense. But finally, and this is, I think, the clincher, is legislate, Republican legislators in Michigan looked upon this as a chance to reform Medicaid. That's how they saw this. And so um, they basically took the approach of, um, you know, we're going to do this on our terms. We're not going to just accept the traditional Medicaid program. We're going to create an alternative. Um, so they uh, put in provisions that emphasized individual personal responsibility and kind of ownership uh, of this, the co-pays, uh, the premiums, um, and the uh, health savings account approach. So that was a big piece of this, kind of personal ownership, personal responsibility, uh, which re required a federal waiver, which was granted. Uh, the second big piece is they insisted that this not be a lifetime program. They didn't want this to be another lifetime entitlement. And so Michigan has a 48-month limit, and after which various provisions kick in, and the federal government has not yet approved that waiver or that, um, that approach or that provision. And I think you'll hear from others that uh, on the panel that you know, that's a pretty iffy proposition as to whether they'll approve it or not. And then finally, I think they looked at it from a, almost a, you know, being able to create a Michigan-specific program, reforming Medicaid. Um, they, they also wanted to look at it from a taxpayer standpoint. And, you know, what's the return on investment if we do this? Uh, and there are various studies that are going to be, have been done, that are going to be done over time. There's going to be a big study that comes out in September, I think, of this year about, you know, is this really working? And what changes maybe Michigan, what changes ought to take place uh, to make this work for Michigan and make sense from a taxpayer standpoint? Now, there were other arguments, but I want to kind of bring my comments to a close. The future, well, you got the second federal waiver that's, you know, kind of sitting out there that if Michigan doesn't get, according to the statute that expanded Medicaid, the program stops within 90 days. I think that's a, an example of sort of the larger issue that uh, is going to play out over time, and that is um, how much flexibility is, is a specific state like Michigan going to have to craft the program they think will work over time. I think that's going to be one of the factors that um, people ought to, watch, ought to watch, even beyond this second federal waiver. Uh, because the, from a Republican standpoint, one of the sore parts about uh, Medicaid is the, the limitations on crafting a state-specific program. And they looked on this as an opportunity to do that. And if that gets taken away over time, I think there's going to be a dramatic lack of enthusiasm to continue it. Thank you. Thanks. So our next speaker, Rob Fowler, is the president and CEO of the Small Business Association of Michigan, the role he's had since 2003. And the Small Business Association serves over 23,000 23, member companies from all of Michigan's 83 counties. Uh, promoting entrepreneurship, leveraging buying power, and engaging in political advocacy. He also serves as the chairman of the Michigan Health Endowment Fund. Please welcome Mr. Fowler. Thank you. Great analysis. Um, you did good. Thank you. <laughs> the other shoe about to drop? No, here? no, no, no. <laughs> so um, maybe just a little bit about um, the Small Business Association of Michigan, maybe even where we've come at this um, a little perspective on where we typically uh, are in this debate. In fact, I remember a, 
press conference at the very beginning when the governor actually sort of uh, invited himself to a press conference that was already going to take place at the hospital association at Sparrow Hospital. And uh, we had already had a conversation with the governor's office and expressed to them that we would be supportive of Medicaid expansion. And so I was uh, also invited to that press conference. And I remember standing there with a you know, the tr traditional press conference, all these people standing up behind all the supporters of Medicaid expansion. Uh, standing in a hospital, it was maybe appropriate to, to remember um, when I was growing up, sitting in a waiting room in a doctor's office, there was always a magazine called Highlights. <laughs> so you'll remember Highlights magazine. One of the puzzles was to look at a picture and figure out what doesn't belong. <laughs> well, I figured it was me at that press conference. Uh, uh, the, the business voice in this group of, of um, supporters of Medicaid expansion actually was either me or a Republican governor. Yeah. Um, and in, in many ways, um, I think a role that we have played throughout this whole thing has been a unique voice, an unusual argument in what is otherwise a group of people who are advocating for either the poor or the healthcare system in general. Um, again, I should also say we did not support the Affordable Care Act. I'm on the board of our national association. Uh, I started all of my testimony with we didn't support the Affordable Care Act. Gave me a little bit of credibility, I think, with, uh, with conservative legislators. Um, so, and, and I often say, you know, I think people would think of us as a kind of right-leaning organization. Uh, we are strategically bipartisan, um, an important... Uh, element, I think even in this debate, I think it gave us entree to both sides of the aisle that maybe other business organizations don't have. Um, but, you know, I speak Tea Party uh, fluently, uh, except for the crazy dialect. I don't really have that down past. But, um, you know, we, we tend to be an organization that relates to conservative policymakers. Uh, I would add, I had a, so we had a partner in this. The State Chamber of Commerce also came along and supported two business organizations, again, that would traditionally be uh, aligned with sort of uh, conservative politics. I think that's important as we, as we think about how this played out. But again, I think it's important to understand our interest in this issue. And much like uh, then Representative Mike Shirky, we had to come to, to the sort of reality that the Affordable Care Act is the law of the land. And what we need to do is figure out how to best play it out in the state of Michigan for our members and for, and for others. So you, you may be aware of this. There is something that's been happening. You know, if you're an advocate for small business in Michigan, um, we have been worried about the cost of health care for a very long time. It's, it's rising at a rate we simply can't sustain it. Uh, the cost of health insurance is how it manifests itself to our members, uh, is rising at a rate faster than any other business expense they have. And there's trying to hold on to that benefit so they can attract and retain good employees, but it's become so, so expensive. So we've been talking about cost for a very long time. In fact, we've been a student of what are the things that drive the cost of healthcare up. And what we know is one of those things is the phenomenon of cost shifting. Um, people show up in our healthcare system and if they don't have coverage, they get care. And that care is actually sort of absorbed by the healthcare system and passed along to paying customers. Um, I joke with my friends at the hospital association all the time, they talk about charity care. Well, hospitals don't go out of business. They literally pass it along. And this is a, you know, not, this didn't, this doesn't happen because it's the public policy. Nobody said, you know, hospitals, you can turn, you can pass along so much to your paying customers. It's happened by default. It's the only place when you squeeze this thing, it can come out. So one of the drivers of the cost of health insurance today is uncompensated care um, that gets passed along paying customers. According to Kaiser Family Foundation, at least when this debate was going on, it was about 14% of current premium are the result of uncompensated care or undercompensated care. So we knew this was a big issue. And so if people were able to show up into our healthcare system with coverage, then we believe that those costs will not be passed along. Now that's a big bet, and frankly, we've, we have taken that bet. Uh, but maybe more importantly, and I want to be careful about taking too much credit, um, I think we had an influence on Mike Shirky in that whole debate. I think 
Mike Shirky was a former hospital board member, and he understood this issue of, of cost shifting, about what happens when people show up in our health system with, without coverage of any kind. Um, he saw it firsthand that those, those costs absolutely get passed along. And if, if we could do anything about it, he was in. And, as Ken has said, uh, the opportunity to sort of reform Medicaid at the same time uh, really was, was what brought him to this table. Um, so we became one of the voices of the coalition and um, we testified uh, both in the House in, the, in a couple of the hearings and in the Senate. Uh, we're part of the coalition as it, as it um, went through. We were at press conferences when the governor uh, was uh, embarrassing Republican state senators for not voting, uh, when he was, you know, um, challenging them to take a vote, not a vacation. Um, there, there was a really tough summer involved in this whole thing. Um, but, and I, I will tell you, the, the Vice President of Government Affairs for our organization today, at the time, was the Chief of Staff for the Senate Majority Leader. And he said, and, and a former Senator and a former House member. Um, and he said it was the toughest issue he's ever, ever been involved in. Now I only say that to say, we, we won it by one vote in the Senate. The old saying in our business is you gotta have 56, 20, and one. You have to have a majority in the House, the Senate, and you gotta have a governor who'll sign it. Uh, this got 56, 20, and one. And I, uh, let me just foreshadow something. What I hope we don't have to do is go back to this same legislature, which is more conservative today than it was then, um, more probably stridently ideological about this issue in particular than it was then. And um, there are a couple scenarios where we might actually have to go back to them. So um, something I hope we'll talk about. Again, I, th I think the, the hope for us is that it will affect cost. Um, and there's some follow-up to, to be done. Uh, if you put a billion and a half dollars to two billion dollars into our healthcare system from outside that would have otherwise been uncompensated, it ought to have an effect on the finances of a hospital and the finances of, in, of insurance companies. You know, so all providers and, and insurance companies. We believe that some of that needs to come back upstream to the payers. And that is the hope and the promise uh, and the reason that we got involved in this in the first place. And so Dr. Ayani's work of measurement of this, of uh, the impact and of the, the outcomes of the Medicaid expansion is really going to be important in its sustain, uh, our ability to sustain it. Let me just say one more thing and then again, uh, we can talk about this a little bit in, in uh, the Q&A. Michigan was one of only two states actually that has a Republican House, Senate, and Republican governor the past Medicaid expansion. So uh, while this is a blue state in presidential elections, this is a red state in local uh, politics. And um, the other states are watching what goes on here. Uh, I was at a meeting of the, uh, an organization called Grant Makers in Health with my Health Endowment Fund hat on, and I can tell you that there are a lot of other states who are watching us. I've, I've had a chance to talk to business organizations in other states about our arguments, about why we supported it. Um, and I think Michigan re really will be a pivotal state in this whole thing. I think if we begin to slide backwards, I see other states going the same way. And uh, that's what's at stake here is really, I think Michigan plays an absolutely critical role in the future of Medicaid expansion. Thank you. So uh, we're off to a great start. So our third speaker is Aaron Knott. Uh, she's the Michigan State Director for Enroll America, which is a national nonprofit organization focused on maximizing the number of Americans who are enrolled in and retain health coverage. She's an accomplished organizer who's dedicated over 15 years to working on legislative, public education, and organizing strategies. Thanks. So I was saying to my friend Laura here that I, I feel like one of us doesn't belong on this panel and it's me because I, I'm, I don't have a stake on the policy side. I mean, in a previous career I did, but for the last two years almost, um, I've been that, the implementer, the boots on the ground in communities across the state of Michigan. 
And you know, we're, we're here today to talk about Healthy Michigan, but for Enroll America, we just are coming off and still kind of recovering from that second historic open enrollment period, which concluded in February. And, and, we're, and we're culminating all those lessons learned and applying it you know, to special enrollment periods in Healthy Michigan. And so it's, it's been a wild ride. And I'd like to step back just to say, you know, at, at the conclusion of that second open enrollment period, I think that Enroll America, particularly in Michigan, has emerged as a go-to organization that the uninsured, we call them consumers, know that they can go to and, and eliminate the political rhetoric and just get the facts about their coverage options related to the Affordable Care Act. You know, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't really matter what your political ideology is when you get cancer or when your kid falls in the parking lot, you know, and, you're, and you don't have coverage. And, and that's kind of how I approach folks across the state when we, when we sit down and talk to them, because there is so much baggage still associated with the Affordable Care Act, but everybody has a family member, a neighbor, somebody that they worship with that had an unexpected illness, and then they dealt with those kind of financial consequences that go along with not having coverage. So again, we're the implementer here at Enroll America, and how, how, how did we accomplish what we've done to date? You know, we celebrate hundreds of thousands of actual conversations with consumers, talking about their options, and then linking them to either in-person assistance or to other kind of avenues to obtain that coverage. Um, we've held just over 10,000 outreach and enrollment events here in Michigan, again, talking about whether it be Marketplace or Healthy Michigan. And we're supported by over 5,600 volunteers right here in Michigan. And those are folks that don't just do one event with us. They're repeated volunteers that run our phone banks, that canvas with us, that table in communities. We are a nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit organization, but we run very much like a political campaign, utilizing the tactics that um, you would think about when you think about an electoral campaign. We're very, very focused on data and analytics, and I want to talk briefly about our database real quick. We have a database that uses models and propensity scores that's way out of my pay grade and league that helps us drill down and find the uninsured. And, and so that helps us focus our work. So instead of just blanketing a community and, and blindly door knocking, I can pull a list and say, based on this propensity score, these four homeowners on Grant Street, we believe are uninsured. And over two enrollment cycles and lots of work to update the model, we now can separate marketplace uninsured uh, eligible uh, in, uh, consumers and healthy Michigan consumers, which again helps us focus our efforts. We work with hundreds of partners across the state to get their information, contacts of consumers that they talk to. We have something called a commitment card that people fill out and kind of tell their story. Again, database is constantly being updated, which allows us to track consumers, um, whether or not they're still uninsured, if they enrolled, and now, as we move forward, um, whether or not they've utilized their coverage. A couple more data points real quick to talk about before I kind of give a little bit of uh, background about our experience. Um, you know, I mentioned in-person assistance a few minutes ago. In-person assisters are critical, particularly for those hard-to-reach populations. Folks that have never had health coverage before, they don't understand it. Heck, I don't understand my coverage that was just recently updated, right? So in-person assistance has been critical for African Americans, Latinos, and young adults to kind of cut through, again, that noise of what this means. And we know that in-person assistance has resulted in two, consumers twice as uh, likely to enroll when they're meeting with somebody face-to-face -face in their community. We also know that repeated contacts with consumers was critical to the success, success of enrollment, whether it be the marketplace or Healthy Michigan. Again, those hard-to-reach kind of populations, African Americans, Latinos, and young adults, respectively, four contacts were needed to drive them out to the marketplace or to Healthy Michigan. Um, you know, the legislature and the governor did, they did a great job. We are one of those only red states that have Healthy Michigan or expanded Medicaid. But it was a nightmare last year for us, particularly at Enroll America, because we were knee deep in the first open enrollment period. And there was suddenly this appetite for coverage. There was a ton of noise out there. People were wanting to enroll. And we had to tell people that we believed to be eligible for marketplace, or excuse me, Healthy Michigan, you're out of luck. Come back on April 1, because the legislature didn't pass immediate effect. And so, you know, we tried to help those folks as best we could by capturing their information, putting them into a, what we call a chase list to contact on April 1, but it was a really difficult time to navigate. Your friend got coverage and got financial assistance and has a quality plan now in March, but you can't do anything until, until April 1. 
So when my colleagues across the country took a break on March 31st, when open enrollment closed, we were ramping up for what was an explosion of another un unknown, like what's going to happen? What's the demand going to be for healthy Michigan? And I got to say that the state of Michigan really got it right by taking some of the lessons learned from the tragic rollout of the marketplace and putting systems in place on the upfront to troubleshoot, to respond to constituents, in-person assisters, groups like Enroll America about some of the snafus. And we didn't see, you know, whether it was um, on the phone or on the, on the web, any of those kind of uh, problems that the marketplace experienced, particularly in October and November. <clears throat> A couple more just kind of quick points. Um, it's great that you know, we're, we're high-fiving each other that over 900,000 folks in Michigan have coverage now for the first time through the Affordable Care Act, whether it's Marketplace or Healthy Michigan. But that doesn't necessarily make a community healthy. You know, having that health insurance card, I got my Blue Cross Blue Shield card in my pocket, but that doesn't make me healthy. So at Enroll America, particularly it, the, the, the team that I'm uh, organizing here in Michigan, we're working with hospitals and other providers to figure out how can we through our scope of service, which is again talking to consumers, help break down some of the obstacles that still exist to making communities healthy. So there's lots of obstacles that I'm not going to go into, but what I can do is take our field tactics, our database, our 5,600 volunteers, and now start drilling into communities and, and, and finding those folks that have coverage and help them access their, their, their coverage, finding a medical home. We know that it's just under 10% of consumers that have Healthy Michigan plans haven't completed their uh, health risk assessment. So how do we engage them in the process of, you know, again, establishing uh, a medical home, um, you know, and getting the services that they need so that they're not in the emergency room or that they're not going untreated? Um, and the last point I'll make on that is, to be continued, we're doing a pilot project, particularly in Southeast Michigan, where, where we have kind of two brackets, two populations, if you will. We have the young adults, I'm not sick, so why in the world would I go to the doctor to get my, my health risk assessment, right? And then you have folks that have lived in you know, institutional poverty for decades, and there's behaviors and patterns, and we need to break those down. So we're doing a pilot project at Enroll America in Southeast Michigan where we're going to use our database, and we're going to drill down and find those folks, those two segments, and see if we can produce some outcomes where people are actually getting out of the emergency rooms and establishing medical homes. Thanks. So our next speaker is Laura Apple. Uh, she's Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives at the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. And she focuses on healthcare policy, hospital finance, legislation, governance, and communications. At the federal level, she represents the interests of Michigan hospitals and health systems in both the legislative and regulatory arenas on key issues, including federal healthcare reform and Medicare. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to first respond to a couple of uh, things that um, Ken Sikama said. I absolutely agree that we needed that, re that conservative Republican lawmaker to help us get Healthy Michigan done. But I also think that it wouldn't have happened without then Senator Roger Kahn, who was also a physician, who also, no, nowhere near as conservative, um, but definitely Republican, <coughs> chair of appropriations in the committee in the Senate, and a physician, and he, I think, just decided, we're doing this, and uh, that, that made a huge difference. The other thing is, uh, I should have mentioned, I should have put this in my prepared remarks, but I'll um, start with it now, which is immediately following the Affordable Care Act, which some of my members, my members are pretty much, I've described to people, who, well, who do you represent? Everybody with an emergency department is my member. So if you got, uh, if you've ever been to an emergency room, you probably went to, to, to somebody that's in my membership now. Um, and especially Trinity and Ascension systems were hugely supportive of the Affordable Care Act. It was extremely important to them from a mission perspective. And about uh, two weeks after the bill was signed into law, my policy department prepared a series of statistics and spreadsheets that showed just how much money every hospital was going to cough up uh, to pay for this, which my Catholic members were not too excited about when they saw that in our lawmakers' offices. But over 10 years, the first estimate over 10 years was that would, Michigan hospitals would forego $7 billion in Medicare reimbursement. So yes, we had already paid at the office 
and uh, we were very, very excited to get those people covered to perhaps earn some of that back and most importantly to get people uh, better organized about their health. Um, last month, the Center for Healthcare Research and Transformation reported that they saw the number of people without health insurance go down by 50%. We have um, some very good data about inpatient care. Our data show that in the first two quarters of 14 that we had the plan, so April through October, we are seeing 50% fewer people presenting without any form of coverage. So people are coming in with some kind of card, even if it's a, a Medicaid card. It's too early to tell you how this is going to specifically impact our costs and reimbursement, but I will unequivocally say, and I, my same policy people have run some numbers, this is absolutely reducing the shortfall between Medicaid costs and Medicaid payment for the majority of hospitals. It is, it, it is, it is raising all boats, but some boats were underwater to begin with. And the reason for this is that in Michigan to um, finance Medicaid, we are hugely dependent on provider taxes. Michigan puts about the same, I see um, Dick Miles is here, and he can probably tell us exactly, but uh, we put a, almost the same amount of money in general fund into our uh, Medicaid program as we did in like the year 2000 or 2002. And we had in the year 2000 or so about a million people covered, and now we have two and a half million people covered. Well, how did we do that with the same amount of money? Well, certainly there's the federal money to support the expansion, but the state doesn't have the match for a, a, an awful lot of what we do. So hospitals pay taxes to do that. We put up the, the state match. And that works really well because it generates a lot of federal money. The problem is, is under federal law, that has to be redistributive. Some hospitals must pay more in tax than they get back in Medicaid payments. So for those hospitals, they, have, they are living on the same amount of money that they had in 2002 or 2003. And they were way underwater and, and kind of continue to be. Of course, they're also the ones that had the fewest amount of Medicaid originally. The other thing that I would say is, um, again, reiterating, this is making a huge difference in hospital finances. The executive budget recommendation this year said, well, we see that this is making a difference. Now, I can show you our estimate that as close as we're getting to, to covering costs, we're not there yet. So we're still losing money on every patient, which it makes it hard to make it up for in volume. But uh, the executive budget recommendation this year said, well, for fiscal year 2016, since you guys are doing better than you were, we should take $92 million of general fund out of your support. Well, it doesn't make a lot of sense to try and get us up to the place where we're going to help Rob's members and then yank it back down by about 10% uh, of, of that. And of course, we can replace some of that with provider taxes, but I just mentioned that whenever I do this on a tax basis, I have to make somebody get less money back than they put in. So it's not a great long-term strategy. The other point that I want to make is and uh, hospitals know this, and, and, and we're working on it, and we need to work on it. But that is, we're not very good at providing enough value for what people are paying, whether it's a third-party payer or a person with a high deductible or a person with a low deductible. <coughs> Our value needs to improve. And to just to cover 900,000 people in Michigan, but do it all the same way we've done it for the last 35 or 40 years, that is not an improvement. We know there's overutilization in some places. We know there's a lot of preventable harm. We're working really hard to try and identify that and, and end it, but that really has to be part of what makes healthcare better in Michigan. It's not simply getting people, you know, we can't line everybody up and give them a card and say this is it, you know, it's great now. The same practice patterns or expenditures that we're making on the population that was already insured that did not lead to the, the best outcomes that we would like to see, we can't just repeat that in this newly covered population. We have to make changes and we have to do better. Um, and we have a long way to go on that. We've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. So that's my comment about the first year. 
Thanks. So our fifth and final speaker is Kim Sabelski, who serves as the Chief Executive Officer of the Michigan Primary Care Association, a role she's had since 1994. Uh, in this role, she works on state and national health system development, planning strategies to improve access to care, and working with public and private stakeholders to reduce health disparities in Michigan. Ms. Sabelski. Thank you very much. Um, unlike Erin, I feel like I'm very much this panel. I think on almost every front, I'm a political um, geek, kind of, not to say that Mr. Sikkim is a geek, but he is pretty <laughs> political. Um, we're major employers in the communities in which we reside, and so I've always felt a strong alliance to Rob Fowler. Certainly, our folks were extremely involved in outreach and enrollment, and I'll kind of demonstrate that for you as I get into my prepared remarks. And like Laura, in the hospitals, we're deep into provision of care, provision of uncompensated care, and have a great need, actually, to make this work, I think. So, um, Health centers, as I'm hoping a few of you know, we serve approximately, we're moving towards 700,000 Michiganders today. All of those in health professional shortage areas or medically underserved areas. So as beautiful as these garden spots are, they're not really usually the most economically viable types of places. So 91.5% of our patients are at 200% of poverty or below. That was 91.5%, 200 or below. In the 100 to 200% range, which tends to be our target here, 21.6% of our patients are within that window. Now, that's not the exact window we're talking about, but it sort of gets you close to this. These numbers, I have to apologize, are 2013 numbers. They don't allow us to illustrate what the impact of year one um, has allowed us to do, but I think that it will give you a sense of how these folks that we serve are very much in the crosshairs of the work that we're talking about here. 44.7% of our patients prior to the Healthy Michigan Plan were covered by Medicaid, so almost half. 31.4% were uninsured. So in terms of the work that we needed to do as health centers in terms of outreach and enrollment, we actually had a big in-reach job and we projected that we would probably pull about 130,000 people through inReach. Our sense is we didn't do too poorly with those folks because even I, I called a number of our members over the past few days to get a little bit of credibility behind my presentation. Always a good idea, I think, as an association member. One of our smaller health centers literally has converted 3,800 of their patients from uninsured into insured. And what we see that being able to do for us is allows us to open up to more of the uninsured that we have not been able to take care of. And that is a dynamic that we believe that we will begin to see more <coughs> as time rolls on because Providers are taking certain numbers of Healthy Michigan Plan patients, but our sense is they'll fill their ranks and some of the, they're uninsured, the um, private providers who have always taken a few. But if they can take Medicaid and sort of not, we believe that that's, that's what we'll begin to see. So right now our uninsured roles tend to be shrinking but as was the situation in Massachusetts, there, when they were full coverage, or as, almost as close as you can get, community health centers still had 30 to 35% uninsured folks. The other interesting thing is about 
of our patients are between the ages of 18 to 64, which kind of has not always been the profile that we have had. And that very much is the demographic that's being reached out to. So uninsured within that age frame, we're kind of like the right folks to do the work in partnership with Aaron's group, with Laura's group, the stuff that Rob really cheered us on for in terms of outreach and enrollment and effect to make this, make this grand experiment, if you will, work. We had historic, well, since CHIPRA, actually, health centers have been recognized as being very competent in outreach and enrollment. We've received national attention for the outreach and enrollment work that we have done. We took that work and we rolled it into the marketplace work, as Erin said, and then we really had impetus to move into Healthy Michigan plan enrollment. At the high point, we had 265 certified application counselors distributed throughout the some 260 sites that we have through in the state of Michigan. At this point in time, we're down to about 230 outreach and enrollment folks, which is extremely exciting for us because, one, we've still got work to do in terms of outreach and enrollment, but the work that Erin talked about in terms of person-to-person -person advocacy and support these are people who are very much queued up for the new work that we have before us that focuses on community health workers and moving out into communities and helping to address the social determinants of health. So we're very, very excited about that work. So what are our health centers seeing with these newly insured patients that they have been seeing and with the newly insured patients who have been going to the emergency rooms or not seeking care at all. I think one of the, one of the things that Laura said about celebrating the savings of this program, you cannot transform a system and save immediately. And the folks that we're seeing coming to care for chronic conditions that have not been treated ever, or the people who have advanced breast cancer who were not diagnosed originally. A number of my members said some of what we're seeing is really heartbreaking and it sure is not money saving. These are folks that are starting to come to care and there will be a bolus of expenditure. Hopefully, at some point in time, we'll be able to see that, uh, that bullet start to level and healthier people in healthier communities. That is certainly what we're looking for. In terms of the objectives for Healthy Michigan Plan, I think that it's really, really important from the political side that we recognize that some of the elements baked into these programs aren't, aren't bad things. The um, health risk assessments, wonderful things. Actually helping people to become an even greater part of their own health care team. Looking to have a little bit of, if you will, personal responsibility. I think it's critical for the success of the program, one, but also the political success of the program, that we be able to advocate, support, and tout the victories that we are seeing and will be seeing in people completing those health risk assessments, becoming a part of their own team, and, if you will, for our Republican conservative friends and colleagues enjoying some of the results of that personal responsibility. In terms of the quote unquote skin in the game, I, I can't speak to that personally. I don't really see that as uh, our health centers 
personal responsibility, but I do think that we need to be able to speak in terms of successes across the board in order to try to create a political environment to be able to keep this operational. We have people coming to care, medical care, dental care, mental health and substance use services that have not received those services historically. We can't help but ultimately see the fruit of all of our labor in healthier communities. But that takes time, and you don't save money right out of the box. In, in closing, what I want to say is that I believe that if we really are going to impact the triple aim, quality, cost, and personal experience, we need to have the vast majority of our public covered. We cannot take a state with 13 to 15 percent uninsured into a project like the statewide innovations model, plan implementation, SIM, and expect that we're going to start to really create change until we literally have a covered, one covered population which we're getting awful darn close. I'm going to say maybe around 93%. I, I have Matt nodding his head, so I'm going to say 93% covered. <laughs> it's not just the coverage, it's the data. Though that coverage allows us to start to have access to. And only with accessible data that can be turned to information to help to drive change, will we see success in a massive undertaking like SIM, $70 million to be expended over four years to help to move Michigan to the triple aim. I really think that we have got to, the additional piece beyond skin in the game and personal responsibility, not to mention health, <laughs> I think we need to say that it's critical that we continue on this pathway in order to effect truly meaningful change in quality, cost, patient experience, economic health run for communities, and a healthier state. So I'm writing that down for Senator Shirky. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers for the very insightful remarks. And now we'll open it up to our uh, students of Masters in Public Policy, uh, Ruth McDonald and Megan Friedman, to uh, introduce the questions that we have from the audience. Thank you. Um, I'm Ruth McDonald, and I'm a student here at the Ford School of Public Policy and also a student at the School of Public Health getting a Masters in Public Health. Thanks for being here. Um, our first question is, for those interfacing with consumers and patients, what has been your experience communicating with consumers about the cost sharing and healthy behavior, financial incentives of the Health Michigan Plan? Are there any concerns about affordability for the patients? And uh, we'll start with Kim and then maybe Aaron, you have additional comments. Thank you. Yeah, my answer will be very brief. Um, health centers provide health, health coverage. No. Health centers create access for folks without insurance by offering the possibility to do a financial review and get sliding fee scale. We had naively assumed that in an expanded coverage world, our sliding fee scale would shift to the folks who are uninsured, as we have historically. What we are finding is a large number of folks who are underinsured. And as a result, thanks to HRSA and Department of Health and Human Services, they have approved that we can utilize our sliding fee scales for those folks who are insured but cannot in, um, can't cover their own financial participation. To me, that's a sign that we have affordability issues. Um, 
one of the things that frustrated me greatly during the entire debate about Healthy Michigan was everybody kept throwing up Arkansas. Isn't Arkansas great? We love Arkansas. Well, I worked on Medicaid managed care when John Engler decided we were going to do it in 1996. So when Arkansas started thinking, well, maybe we'll use managed care, it had been 17 years since we started it. Um, and we had had co-pays and um, deductibles uh, for most of that time. Um, we have, I think it's a $50 first day inpatient deductible. And I would say that for the most part, hospitals just don't collect it. It's not collectible. Um, so it's a, it basically is a, it's a rate change for us. Um, but I understand why those people, I mean, these are people who just don't really have anything, especially in the, the population before we got to expansion. <clears throat> Excuse me, just a couple of points. Um, you know, during the first open enrollment period, uh, probably January, maybe early February of 2014, we at Enroll America shifted our message because we realized folks weren't taking the opportunity to enroll. Again, this is the marketplace because they didn't understand that financial assistance was available. And so all of our talking points was about financial assistance. Um, you know, at the conclusion of the second open enrollment period, we know that 88% of those enrollees received some form of financial assistance, and 68% of those folks got it for $100 or less, so a plan for $100 or less. And, you know, sometimes you might have seen me in the media talking about, well, that's the cost of my cell phone bill. But, I mean, the reality is still $100 is still, at times, unaffordable for folks. Um, and so there's, there's that point to make. There's also the point that um, we're seeing after, whether it's Healthy Michigan or, or two marketplace enrollments, um, consumers didn't understand what they purchased, and they, don't, they didn't read through the fine print um, to see that they have things such as copays or deductibles, and that, that was a surprise to them. So we're trying to do better as folks renew next year um, to make sure that they understand what they're signing on to. And a second point to that is, in this, t this time around, we saw substantially, again, this is focused on the marketplace, but Silver plans were no longer the most popular. Well, this, I'm sorry, that's misleading. Silver plans, we were getting feedback from those that were re-enrolling, even with financial assistance, weren't determined to be affordable for them. And so they were opting to go with Brown's plans that you know, has $6,000 um, uh, deductibles and up. And, and so again, we, we have to work with folks to understand what the consequences could be to the choices that they're making, you know, trying to balance their monthly what's coming in and out. Thank you. Uh, my name is Megan Foster Freeman. I'm a first year master's in public policy student here at the Ford School. I'm um, interested in women's health and prevention. And just want to thank you all again for all of your wonderful insights. This is a question from the audience talking about uh, just you know the remarkable enrollment in Healthy Michigan. As everyone has said, it's really outpaced expectations. Why was this so successful beyond the predictions that were originally made? You know, are we capturing much of the hard to reach population? Um, if so, where do we go from there? If not, how do we continue to make sure that people don't fall through the cracks? Maybe Bob and Aaron would like to get started at, at, at the risk of sounding very negative, um, I don't think it's great that we had 600,000 people that could qualify. I mean, we now have 25% of our population qualifies for Medicaid. That's how many people are that low of an income. When I talked earlier about we essentially doubled the number of people on Medicaid in roughly 10 years during the years the 2000s, we made no changes to eligibility. That was all people just getting poorer. And so to have, ex where are we compared to marketplace about uh, are we at our where are we at our expect, expected level of the marketplace enrollment? We're below. I mean, basically, we thought people were going to belong in the marketplace, and they belong in Medicaid. Um, so uh, I think that's part of the reason. Um, I'm really glad we have it. I absolutely am glad we have it. I'm kind of disappointed we don't have it a little more balanced. I don't know if you guys wanted to say anything about that. Well, I I, I agree. I I don't. I described earlier, I, I felt like this was the, the commercial where they've just launched a website and you, they're watching, they get their first hit and then another one, and then it looks really great, and then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, that's out of control. And I, I felt that way a little bit about um, Healthy Michigan, and 605,000 is the number, I think, as of today. Um, and, and really, I feel, you know, I, I feel it's success as it relates to enrollment, but 
like Laura, I'm not sure that speaks well of, of the state uh, and our economy. Honestly, my sense is the economy is getting better. From where I sit, we're certainly healing. Um, but I think it speaks to a lot of people who sort of dropped out of the economy altogether, and this is a way to measure that. And it's not, that's not good news necessarily on some fronts. Um, for those who supported the passage of the Healthy Michigan Plan for cost reasons, or I think that was one of the reasons the, of the support, uh, what is your plan if the evaluation of Healthy Michigan uh, does not, and the evalu evaluation finds that um, Healthy Michigan Plan did not bend the cost curve? And sort of on a related note, um, as we heard, the state is authorized to rescind Medicaid expansion in 2017 if cost savings for the expansion can be found. Um, do you think the legislature would actually rescind it at this point, um, or what do you think sort of the, the realistic options um, going forward are? I wonder if we could start with Ken, with the legislative perspective. He's glad he's not there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yes, one of the, uh, I, I think, selling points here in Michigan was that, you know, we're going to save money. Um, over time, and it's sort of baked into the statute. You know, they're going to do these calculations, and if that's not true, then we pull the plug. Um, I'm not sure that's what will happen uh, for a couple reasons. One is once you start something, and it sort of gets ingrained in government. Um, it's hard to it's hard to reverse course. I mean, I think that's been my experience. Um, now that doesn't mean that um, the, the the people that put that in there aren't well intentioned, and that it it is certainly possible. I, I think over time um, it's more likely that. Um, that they'll want to make changes to this. I mean, just, just you know, this, ha this happened a year ago or two years ago, and um, maybe it's not going to work. What, what do I mean by that? Well, maybe the co-pays and the premium um, sharing from recipients, you know, I think the theory is that will help them take ownership and they'll get healthy because they don't want to spend the copay to go in the hospital or whatever, and, and that'll be an incentive to you know, for healthy behaviors. Well, maybe it won't be. So maybe there's a different way to structure Medicaid that will become uh, apparent in three years. And they'll want to make some changes. So I, I for one, uh, am uh, somewhat uh, circumspect about whether or not um, the lack of measurable cost savings to the Michigan taxpayer will mean the plug gets pulled over time when they, they will want to maybe make some other changes. And maybe they'll say, maybe that'll be the reaction. Maybe they'll say, well, if we make changes X, Y, and Z, there will be cost savings. So I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit, uh, like I said, circumspect whether that trigger would um, end the program. I'm a little bit more certain that federal government, and I'm going to say recalcitrance, um, you know, not approving the second waiver would have a better, bigger impact on having the program end. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, I, I um, maybe a slightly different perspective. I did a lot of arm twisting of, of Republicans during this debate. Um, and it was, I, we tried very hard to stay on message. This is about cost saving, not to the state, that's not who I represent, but to insurance premium payers in our state. The cost of health care, again, manifests itself as premiums for us. And um, I feel like I'm very much out on a limb. And I feel like um, I've taken some policy makers with me out on that limb. And um, We've, we've taken a 
policy bet that this will manifest itself as cost savings, bending the cost curve. I don't, I'm not so naive as to think it's really going to notch down, but in a measurable way, showing that instead of going on this trajectory, it, it is lower. Um, I think if that doesn't manifest, then there will some, be some, some policymakers who are the champions from the conservative side who will rethink their position. So I'm, uh, I think it, absolutely it's very difficult to take away a benefit that's been given. But let me tell you, you, you hear all this. Um, this took on all the arguments of a welfare debate. It, really, if you think it ending at, in 48 months, having some skin in the game, personal responsibility, all of those are arguments about welfare. Um, and so this really became, to a lot of conservatives, the one of the basket of welfare things we provide to citizens. Uh, I get that. I actually tend to agree with that, that if, if it becomes too comfortable to not work, there become incentives to not do so. Um, I wouldn't start with health care, however, if I were going to pull back some sort of public benefits. Uh, the ac access to health care actually becomes the nexus for a lot of other ability to make it to work and take care of your kids and those sort of things. So this isn't the place I would, I would concentrate if I were going to try to pull back a little bit. But I think this is the most recent thing on the table, and therefore it's vulnerable to being pulled back. So people have time for one or two more questions. Excellent. All right. Well, I think uh, we're going to pull one from Twitter here, uh, so we can bring in our friends on the internet. Um, this one comes from a Twitter user who wants to talk about, uh, as many of you have mentioned, expanding coverage doesn't mean making people healthier. So expanding coverage isn't always enough. How do we improve, how do we accomplish improved practice patterns, reduce overutilization and preventable harm? And I think I'd like to tack on that too. How do we encourage healthy behaviors and prevention in the populations that we're serving? Nothing about world peace. That's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, You know, there are perhaps um, within the healthcare community, and, and Dr. Davis might want to speak about this, for example, we are, I would say, partners on the uh, overuse of opioids. Um, and uh, we have another, this is a collaborative that the, our hospitals will do the work, MHA will convene, to work on uh, over uh, subscribing or, uh, you know, to basically weed out the, the wrong practices around using opioids uh, as part of an inpatient stay and, and, and after surgery. That is, I don't know what number of collaborative we've worked on improving care in the ICU, eliminating urinary tract infections, uh, safer surgeries, safer and better uh, OB, you know, getting people, everybody to term, um, all kinds of stuff that we've been doing. But there's a lot of fatigue out there among the caregivers. There are 900 measures, Collaboratives from the MHA, collaboratives from, or rules from LeapFrog, Blue Cross has their things. Um, as uh, Dr. Joyce Lee, who is from the University of Michigan, said last week during the Detroit Chamber, you know, nobody got up and said, I want to be a doctor so I can do really poor, sloppy care and maybe people won't feel so good at the end of it. Um, so nobody's got that goal, but certainly, you know, bad things are happening to good people. Uh, in our system, and we're, we're really working to improve that. Um, one thing that I commend to everybody, because I read it before every time I do one of these things, is the busted healthcare myths from the spring 2008 findings of the School of Michigan, mean, U of M School of Public Health. Um, just, just in case you're interested. You know, a lot of the things that we want to do to improve uh, care, um, you know, they're not going to they're not going to be the answer I think that with what Rob said earlier we need people to be in a better place and being in your your intersection with the healthcare system is usually very brief I hope it is I hope you only see your doc a couple times a year for simple things like a flu shot and a physical maybe that's even that's like well wow. <laughs> um, but the other 363 days you're on your own. And that's where, that's where the rubber really hits the road in terms of healthy, having a health, healthy population. So yeah, we got a long way to go on preventable harm, absolutely, among all of those other things that were mentioned. 
But being healthy goes way beyond whether or not, you're not gonna get healthy by being, we can cure people in an inpatient setting, we can't keep them healthy because you're gonna get out of that inpatient setting. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, our final question, um, and Kim, I think uh, you might uh, be the first one to tackle this, but several states have clarified that Medicaid expansion also covers transition-related care for transgender residents. What will it take for Michigan to overcome this policy deficit for such a vulnerable population in the state? Would you just read that one more time? Please? Sure. Um, several states have clarified that Medicaid um, also covers transition-related care for transgender residents. What will it take for Michigan uh, to you. pass this policy? <laughs> I got nothing. I'm going to give this to Sycamore. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe Dr. Davis, so I don't know what our policy is on that. Well, right. And, and I mean, it's, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful debate because <laughs> it's my sense that the governor has staked himself out to not, to not sign a religious freedom bill unless there is LGBT language within, and I always, you're better at the names of those bills, but the- um, Elliot Larson. Elliot Larson, thank you. Um, at which point I think Mr. Shirky, Senator, excuse me, Shirky has said he's going to, he's going to, Move it forward. So it's going to be a wonderful rugby match. Um, I have no strong sense of how, how it will wrap up, but what I will say is I do not take Senator Shirky lightly. I do not. I have not seen Will like his since Governor Engler. And I pulled all the kids off the streets when Engler went. Because <laughs> he knew what he wanted and he would get he it done. So I'm not sure that's an answer to, to that question. But fundamentally speaking, it will be dealt with, I think, politically before it gets dealt with in terms of coverage and care. If, if I could offer just a, a <coughs> observer's answer to the question, when will Michigan do this? I would say no time soon. Uh, again, if you look at the political makeup of our legislature, that is just not on the drawing board uh, in, in any significant way. Uh, I, would, I would say Kim has rightly said that you know, the Indiana religious freedom effort and Michigan's expansion of Elliott Larson coming together isn't going to happen anytime soon either. I just think the political uh, environment right now will suggest that that doesn't get done. Well, but there's another there's there's another issue there because as I understand the question, it's it's um, using taxpayer dollars, Medicaid, to fund that transition. Is if I understood the question, yeah. and regardless of how the Elliot Larson debate plays out or how the Religious Freedom Restoration Act <laughs> debate plays out, I can't imagine. This is where I agree. With, I can't imagine. Um, this legislature or any legislature in the foreseeable <laughs> future making the decision to use taxpayer money to fund that procedure. Because that, that's what you're asked about. And you could, um, you could add... Exactly. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to get in a debate with you. I, I'm giving you a political, a political judgment about... Um, I mean, you can add LGBT rights to the so, so Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act. You cannot pass the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And it wouldn't do this, right? And but you still have that remaining issue. Um, so I, that's why I agree with mm -hmm. with Rob. I think it's important to put that. Um, that's a wrinkle in that question that needs to be on the table that people need to understand. I think. Well, as we wrap up our policy talk for today, I first want to invite all of you to the reception that the Ford School is hosting right in the Great Hall outside the Wild Hall here where we're meeting. 
uh, and can, we'll uh, begin right after our session today. I want to thank Dean Collins and Dr. Davis and Cliff Martin in the back uh, well, for uh, hosting us and, and organizing today's events here at the Ford School. I want to thank our student questioners, Ruth and Megan, for uh, moderating our discussion. And most of all, I want to thank our five uh, guests from across the state for sharing very uh, thoughtful insights into the future of the Healthy Michigan Plan here. Thank you. Thank you.